Hey there, it's Nika Sewell Smith here at Who is Nika Smith? And I could not let this day go by without having or giving honor to one of my ancestors. It is the 125th anniversary of the death of Isaac Rogers. And Isaac Rogers was my great great grandfather. He uh, was a man of many talents, uh, <laughs> lots of exploits, um, lots of things happened in his life. But 125 years ago today, he was killed at a train depot in Fort Gibson in the Indian Territory. And so I wanted to spend a little time today because I felt like I could not um, let this day go by without actually um, giving life to um, his life. Um, to talk about what happened that day. Hello, thank you guys. I just figured I would come on really briefly and talk about this. Um, I'm gonna place the link to this blog post that details exactly what happened on this day 125 years ago. I'll be sure to share that in the chat. So if you wanna read and look at the documents and do all kinds of stuff like that um, later on today, feel free to do that. But let me go ahead and tell you about what happened in the Indian Territory today, 125 years ago. All right, I'm gonna read this blog post. Of course, I'm gonna make it interesting. Um, so feel free to ask questions, whatever you want um, there in the chat. All right, hello. Hi, there's a lot of you who join me. Um, I actually haven't streamed directly to YouTube in a while, but anywho, let's get to the story. All right, so Crawford Goldsby, also known as Cherokee Bill, um, at this point was dead, okay? What you have to remember is two years before we get to April 20th, 1897, Cherokee Bill had been captured by Ike Rogers, who is my great great grandfather. And he was an Indian outlaw. If you saw the movie, The Harder They Fall, that was on Netflix, um, Cherokee Bill was played by Lakeith Stanfield. And in that movie, he gets shot in the neck and he bleeds out in the middle of town. Well, that's not what really happened. What really happened was that Cherokee Bill was captured um, by Clint Scales and my great great grandfather, Isaac Rogers, who delivered him, Cherokee Bill, to. Um, Judge Isaac Parker, who presided over the Indian Territory at Fort Smith, and later Crawford Goldsby, aka Cherokee Bill, was hung at the gallows. And so because of this, um, this is what happened. So we we get to this climactic, Cherokee Bill's captured, Ike is there, he gets a reward, all of that. And that's what gets us to 125 years ago today. So Crawford Goldsby, uh, also known as Cherokee Bill, was dead. It, it didn't matter all the chaos that he and his gang had caused. He was never coming back. His family was grieved, but the community was actually relieved because he had been terrorizing them for an extended period of time. The robberies and the shootings were over. Life kept moving, but apparently Isaac Rogers, one of the men who made sure that Bill was captured, wanted time to stand still for better or for worse. Clarence Goldsby, Bill's brother, wanted no part of Ike's plans. All right. And if you want to learn about Ike Rogers and his exploits um, and how I came to find out that I was related to him as his great great granddaughter, I'm going to go ahead and place the link to that in the chat. So if you want to read that, you can read that later. Thank you um, for referring your um, narrative viewers to me. Awesome. All right. So let's keep moving on. So um, here we have Grandpa Ike. Um, at this point, he has already fought for the first Kansas USCT 79th Regiment, which was, was which was the first uh, unit to be organized, um, sea battle and sea casualties in the Civil War that was Black. He had survived that, survived the Civil War. He was a commissioned U.S. Deputy Marshal. Um, and at this point, um, he had been recommissioned in order to capture Bill in 1895. So when we get to the date of his death, all of this has taken place. And so uh, catching outlaws is hard work, right? And because of this, rewards were often given to those who could complete the job. Now, apparently Grandpa Ike received about $50, which is equivalent to more than $1,400 now, from a prominent merchant of the Cherokee Nation. We don't know who that was, but someone in the nation gave Grandpa Ike this reward. But the reward came with consequences. Just months after the capture of Cherokee Bill, Grandpa Ike started to fear for his life and was caught carrying a gun, despite the fact that his commission as a U.S. Deputy Marshal had technically ended. Now, the Coffeyville, Kansas police were not having any of this. Now, you got to remember the Indian Territory, especially where my folks are from in the Cherokee Nation. You know, you've got Kansas directly north and then you've got uh, Arkansas and Missouri that are east of it. So we're talking about sort of like a four state area that, that you can find um, information. 
So in the territory news um, from the Muskogee Phoenix on September 19th, 1895, it notes that Deputy Marshal Ike Rogers, who was concerned in the capture of Cherokee Bill, was disarmed in Coffeyville recently by order of the officers. He claims that as friends of Bill have threatened to kill him, he is justified in going armed at all times. The Coffeyville police thought differently. So hmm, here we have the scenario. He has a gun. He's scared for his life. Well, hey. So as we get to today, 125 years ago, right? What had been happening at the time is that there were a lot of payments that were going out to uh, not just the Cherokee Nation and its citizens, but also, of course, the Cherokee freedmen who are citizens. I am one of them to this day. And so after Bill's capture and eventual hanging, the Cherokee freedmen had received their portion of a large sum of money. Estimates are between $850,000 to a $1 million at the time for the seeding of lands known as the Cherokee Strip or the Cherokee Outlet. And this land at one point belonged to the Cherokee Nation, but the U.S. government allowed people People, you know, again, you got to remember land runs and things were happening at this time. The U.S. government allowed Americans, right? Remember, this is a country within a country to settle on this trip. And the Cherokee Nation sued the federal government and was able to get this payment. Well, when the payment was first doled out, the freedom were not were not included in it. And so we had to sue in order for us to get our portion of the payments. So as this dispersal of money is happening, right? Um, it's taking place in Hayden, which is in the Indian Territory, and that started in 1897. Now, both Ike and Clarence, who became Ike's murderer, they stood to receive their share as one of up to 5,000 Cherokee freedmen. But after many delays and a lot of frustrations within the community, things began to get tense. There were notaries in the area who were charging upwards of $3, which, you know, if you adjust that for inflation, is up to $87, right? The notaries were charging the equivalent of $87 to sign identity affidavits. And then there were also thugs and swindlers from all over who were arriving to get a chance to become richer, right? To maybe potentially prey on folks who were getting money, all of that. And it was so bad that the government actually sent troops to oversee all of this because it just got so out of control. And so naturally, with all that was going on, Hayden seemed like a prime opportunity for a tussle between Ike and Clarence. Because remember, Bill had been killed, hung, and two years had elapsed. Grandpa Ike was scared for his life. And, and it just, stuff was just boiling over, right? And so based on newspaper accounts, they got into a dispute before Clarence actually killed Grandpa Ike. And it had to have happened between February of 1897 and April of 1897. And so it's clear from several accounts, right, um, in family oral history that my family, the Rogers, and the Goldsby families were actually more than acquaintances. Um, and perhaps the familiarity is what led to a sense of betrayal on the part of the Goldsby family against Ike and, of course, my family because of Bill being captured. There was definitely enough fuel to light several fires and burn several egos. When you look into the newspaper, you find mentions of these acquaintances, right, or these connections. Um, in fact, the Coffeyville Weekly on January 11th, 1895, mentions that Cherokee Bill, this is before he was hung, that he appears to be going alone now, going it alone now, and is getting unusually bold um, for a man with the price upon his head. A few nights ago, he attended a dance at the, the house of ex-deputy Ike Rogers near Nawada. So here we have in the paper that clearly my great-great-grandfather was entertaining this outlaw that later on that year, he would take, you know, and deliver to be hung at the gallows. Now, reports vary as to what happened between uh, Bill's brother Clarence and Ike, right? Um, one report, which is in the book called Hell on the Border, it mentions that uh, Grandpa Ike attempted a quarrel with Clarence, um, doubtless um, from a sense of guilt at the wrong he had done him, though betraying his brother uh, for several days. He continued to abuse Clarence, addressing him by all manner of vile names and epithets and even threatening his life. I don't dispute that because that's right along with the brand of Grandpa Ike. Um, then there's an account from the Coffeeville Daily Journal where they said young Crosby was at Hayden and met Rogers and they had some unpleasant words during which it was said that Grandpa Ike slapped Clarence and abused him generally. I, I don't know. Um, there's also a report that Clarence Goldsby, a younger brother of Cherokee, you know, Bill, uh, declared he would kill Ike Rogers. At the payment of Hayden, Rogers is said to have questioned young Goldsby about his threat, even presenting a gun at his head or otherwise abusing him. So basically Ike was like, come see me dog. Like you over here selling wolf tickets, 
about this whole situation. Clearly you're mad that um, your brother got caught and I got the reward and all that, right? And so uh, the youngster was at the time unarmed, right, when this whole tussle happened, but uh, informed Rogers that if he ever came to Fort Gibson, the killing would certainly be done. So the matter rested until Tuesday morning. So we're getting closer to, right? So we don't, who was the true aggressor? What words were exchanged? We don't know. Did Ike phys actually physically assault Clarence? I don't know. Was Ike provoked based on, upon what he heard through the grapevine? You can see how the newspapers were just doing the most, okay? So what's clear is that Ike and Clarence did encounter each other and whatever happened, Clarence wanted Ike to know that he was not about that life, right? Like he just wasn't. And in turn, Ike wanted Clarence to know he wasn't studying him, right? So it was clearly a battle of testosterone and proportions. So then we get to April 20th, okay? Now the Coffeeville Daily Journal, you see they're just all, in, it, they're just all in up and through this story. Um, they reported that Clarence waited patiently for the train arriving at Fort Gibson and carrying Ike to arrive every morning. So he was waiting for Ike to show up for this payment, okay? Now Ike stepped off the train acting normally and according to the Muskegee, uh, Muskogee, Phoenix, um, Grandpa Ike went about shaking hands. So he's shaking hands. Then the crime was committed. There was a huge crowd when Clarence fired the fatal shots, but we don't know exactly how many times Grandpa Ike was shot. One, one report says that Clarence walked up to him, reached over a woman's shoulder, shot him through the neck with a 44, breaking his neck. When Rogers fell, Crosby fired two more shots in the face, pow, pow, one through his left eye and the other just below it, passing clear through his head. So that account says shots. Then another account says when Gold advanced upon the back and right side of Rogers, and shot him through the neck, boom, with a revolver. Rogers gave a groan oh, as he fell, and Goldsby continued to advance and fire until five shots were fired. Well, no, wait, this account said it's five shots. Last one said it's three. All right, then it says stretch on the platform with a bullet hole through his neck and three more through his head lay Ike Rogers colored of kooskooey and silent in death. Okay, now it's four shots. Then we go into another report. Ike Rogers, the man who captured Crawford Goldsby, alias Cherokee Bill, was shot three times at Fort Gibson, uh, Indian Territory today by Clarence Goldsby, a brother of the Desperado. OK, maybe it was three. We don't know. Even we even have a photo of Ike dead, um, but you can't really tell how many times he was shot. Um, we may never know the accurate number of times, the fact that he was gone, just like Bill, um, and he left behind a widow and eight known children. In fact, his youngest child was just a day shy of turning a year old when Ike fell dead at Fort Gibson that day. His third oldest son died exactly six years after he did, to the day. Clarence Goldsby was never apprehended, okay? Alan Lynch, who was also a part of the 1st Kansas United States Color Troop 79th Infantry, um, he mentioned that he was present at the depot platform at Fort Gibson on the 21st of April, which should have been the 20th, um, and witnessed the killing of the said Isaac Rogers by Clarence Goldsby. Alan Lynch said he saw the remains of Ike Rogers after he was dead. Um, he was the first man to him after he fell uh, the, you know, from the fatal shot of Goldsby's gun. Um, and yes. How did the son die? Um, well, he just passed away. Um, I think it might have been from tuberculosis, which is crazy. But yeah, it's this day has a big significance to my family. So what happens? It says the remains of the dead man were removed from the depot to the camp of the freedmen near the military post, prepared for burial and taken away on the evening train to the town of Nawada, near uh, which place he resided. Um, he, we don't have a death certificate. Um, at least one newspaper noted that a couple of photographers were on hand the day to uh, of the shooting took place, but efforts to locate photographs have come up empty, um, except for the one that we have in the book, Hell on the Border. Um, it mentions that um, his wife at the time, whose name's Sarah Fry, um, his daughter, which would be Aunt Ethel, um, were both almost prostrate with grief. At the time of Ike's death, he was married to um, Sarah Fry, um, who was a daughter of Andy and Millie Fry. She was also a Cherokee freedman. Um, Sarah would go on to marry Joseph Whitmires a couple years uh, after Ike's death. She ended up dying on June 16, 1902, which orphaned their three children ages 16, 14, and six years of age. Um, most likely I'm believing the daughter could have been, um, Aunt Ethel, but it could have been Aunt Florence Bratcher. She was 27 at the time, but Ethel was 11 years of age when her father passed away. And there are no known details that seem to exist about like, funeral service, where it took place, or the event that happened. Um, oral history does state that Ike was buried 10 miles south of the Kansas-Oklahoma border in a little town and seminary, cemetery called Lenapah. 
Um, instructions to get there include going south on Highway 169 to Nowata. Um, it has been many years since family members have gone there. In fact, some folks actually went there about a year ago. We did not find a headstone and we weren't entirely sure of the cemetery. Um, there's still a bunch of questions, um, but regardless, the events of April 20th, 1897 still resonate within our family. And although we are all far removed from the Wild West to the old tales, um, this is definitely a story that needs to be told. So that was my story time for today. Wanted to commemorate the 120. Uh, 20th, um, 5th anniversary of the death of my ancestor, Ike Rogers. So I hope you learned something. Story time. Um, definitely go back and read the posts that are there. Definitely have a lot more to write about him, but I want to give love and light to one of my former ancestors and also recognize his children, um, Florence Rogers Bratcher, Luther Clyde Rogers, Eddie Rogers, Nelson Van Rogers, Theodore Kuiskui Van Rogers Sr., who is my great-grandfather, Ethel Jane Rogers Reed, Raymond Andrew Rogers, and Roy McKinley Rogers, who was just a year old when his father died. All right. Have a great day. Thanks for story time. Bye-bye.